from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, everyone. I just want to welcome you to the today's Topics and Preservation series. I'm the Chief of, name would be helpful, Finale France Chief of the Preservation Research and Testing Division. And we're delighted to today, to have today here uh, Dr. Andrew Davis, who is one of our chemists here in the Preservation Research and Testing Division, talking about centuries of cellulose, lessons learned from the molecular analysis of cellulose in aged paper collections. And Andrew has become a, a very critical part of our preservation team and we're really delighted. So uh, Andrew has a background, uh, his PhD was in polymer science and engineering from the University of Massachusetts Amherst in 2014. From there he worked at 3M developing adhesive uh, chemistry and photographic processes and came to the library in 2016. And without further ado I will pass over to Andrew. Great, thanks Vanella. Uh, so I will be talking today a little bit about uh, cellulose and paper materials as they age. And so what, what I mean by aging, I'll jump right into it, is as far as we're concerned here, that means paper durability and paper permanence. How does paper behave and stay preserved over a long period of time? And when we're looking at it as preservationists and conservators, a lot of times we can judge it based on what I like to call the eyeball test. Most of the time you can look at an object, you can look at some paper and say, what is bad, what is good, is this in bad shape, do we need to do something with this object, with this material? But that doesn't always pass muster, sometimes you need quantitative measurements. And there are a number of ways over the years uh, that people have taken quantitative assessments of paper-based materials. These range from chemical assessments like pH or inductively coupled plasma or XRF, which are familiar to various folks in this room for analyzing elemental compositions or metallic components that are in, in paper materials. There's spot testing, again, identifying specific elemental or chemical components in paper. Um, when the eyeball test doesn't work or you need something a little more specific, you can do optical testing and then you can also do physical testing. Things like fold or tensile measurements that give you a quantitative assessment of material. Um, but what none of these techniques address is the underlying fundamental building block of paper itself, and that's cellulose. And if anyone in here remembers a really fantastic Powers of 10 video, or zooms in and out different length scales, you can see what materials are at what scales. Uh, cellulose really is the, the fundamental building block, about as small as you can get when you start from the raw material, starting from trees or, or wood-based materials or rag-based materials, all the way down past the cellular structure, past cell walls, past fibrils, past fibers, down to cellulose. And what cellulose looks like is a string of sugar molecules linked together, and that's what this N represents, uh, over and over and over and over again to make a very long chain polymer. And there's actually even more complicated structure there where you have hydrogen bonding interacting both within a cellulose chain and between cellulose chains. But it really is the fundamental material building block that makes up paper. And when we talk about cellulose degradation, mostly what we're talking about is cellulose scission or breakage of cellulose chains. And the two main mechanisms that this can happen by, and if you hold with me for just this slide, this is about as deep into the organic chemistry as I get. Um, you've got acid hydrolysis where you can break usually that oxygen linkage there and you'll take one long polymer chain of cellulose and you'll split that up into two smaller ones. You can also have oxidation where the rings often will open up and then these will expose some functional groups that can go on to perform additional chemistry often in a degradative nature, uh, either color changes or again chain scissions and start breaking down the chains. And so when you talk about quantifying this, how do you quantify what's happening 
to the cellulose molecules that make up paper. There's a method that's very popular in polymer science, and that's called size exclusion chromatography. And like any chromatography, it separates chemical components based on some criteria. And in this case, it separates polymeric molecules, large scale molecules, based on their size. And it does this by taking some samples uh, with both large and small chain cellulose, flows them through a porous media that physically separates them by size, and so the larger molecules will come out at a different time than the smaller molecules. You can detect them and then come up with a quantitative measurement of how much small chain cellulose there is relative to large chain cellulose that you started with in your sample. And we refer to this entire series as the distribution. What's the distribution of cellulose sizes in your sample? And so I'll refer to this as, as the distribution. Um, and that distribution can be captured by a single quantitative simplification called the molecular weight. Um, and I can spend an entire day talking about how you make that simplistic quantification. There are different measurements and points along this distribution you can use. But the idea is it's one simple identifier for what this distribution looks like. Um, you may be more familiar with that, whoops, in terms of the degree of polymerization. And that's just another way of referring to the molecular weight. And so if I say molecular weight, or if I say degree of polymerization, degree of polymerization just adjusts for the size of those sugar repeat units. Um, but know that I mean the same thing. And so if you're more comfortable thinking about one or the other, you can swap those in your mind. Um, they are both a simplification of that more complicated distribution. And I'll be showing you examples of both. Uh, I'm not going to get too deep into the preparing samples for size exclusion chromatography. I will say that we are using a direct dissolution method. We're taking the cellulose. We're not doing any chemical modifications to it from the paper. We are directly dissolving it in a solvent system. And so for using solvents in size exclusion chromatography, that's been used for decades in polymer science with synthetic polymers and plastics like styrene or PET. Uh, but for cellulose, it's really just been pinned down in the past decade or so how to do this through a direct dissolution method. And that's because it's a tremendously complicated solvent and solute system. Uh, Anshya Potest has done some excellent work reviewing uh, what goes into these different systems that you can use to dissolve cellulose. And so if you want to know more, I highly recommend looking up her work. Um, but it does take a long time and it's fraught with complications, but it can be done. And the method we're using is one of the benchmark methods that is used with cellulose scientists. It's something we use just because it's comparative to other cellulose researchers in the field. And so why size exclusion chromatography? Like I said, it's a direct measurement of the fundamental building block in your paper materials. And it's a cornerstone of polymer science that the size of a polymer is directly related to material degradation. As the material degrades, the polymer chains will start breaking. You can measure that. As the chains start breaking, that's intimately related to material properties, how strong it is, how, how durable it is. It also reveals minor changes that are perhaps undetectable or only very subtly detectable by physical measurements. Um, and to give you an example of that, I'll use something um, that we use in the lab, that we've used size exclusion chromatography in the lab for, um, a pretty big team effort that's been ongoing for a number of years before I came here even, um, on iron gall ink treatments. And this is both in preservation research and with conservation. A number of folks I can see in the room who've been working on this project. Um, and iron gall ink is a corrosive but historically important ink. And you can see iron gall ink induced degradation on objects from the library collection, as well as on lab prepared samples from lab prepared iron gall ink. And you can see how corrosive it is. This is an aged paper on the right there. And you can see that the paper tends to break and fracture right along ink lines. We know this, we know that this is a problem, um, but to me it seemed like size exclusion chromatography would be interesting to see what has happening to the cellulose molecules um, in the area that has been inked. Uh, that's just a little bit of the chemistry of how iron undergoes Fenton reactions. Um, both of the bad actors I talked about before, acid and oxidative species, are involved with a redox reaction of iron. So really there's a perfect storm in iron gall ink 
for cellulose degradation. And what I want to see is whether we can track any changes of treatments that this team has been working on developing to see what's going on at the molecular level of cellulose. And so this is that lab prepared sample with lab prepared iron gall ink. And these are two control samples starting with unaged, so just right after inking. Um, and you can see this is the, the molecular weight distribution from size exclusion chromatography. And you can see that there's high molecular weight species up to about a million grams per mole is the predominant size of cellulose there. Um, and you have some smaller components as well. And this is just in that heavily inked region, the underlying paper. And it gives you a degree of polymerization of about 2800 of the cellulose. After artificial aging, so this is high heat, high humidity in an oven for 28 days, you can see that all of those high molecular weight cellulose molecules are almost gone. There's very little left. Um, they've all broken down into much smaller cellulose chains, uh, about 10,000 molecular weight. Degree of polymerization reduced about tenfold, about 150. And so these are papers without any treatment on them. And the question is, what are some of the conservation treatments we could apply? What do they do over time? How do they help preserve, if they help preserve, the cellulose molecular structure? And so I'm not going to get too deep into the details here. This is something we're hoping to, to publish and get out there. And I don't want to give away the punchline to any of this. So I'll talk just very broadly about different treatments. Um, and so for example, all the treatments I'll show are after aging. And I'm going to compare them to these two controls. So all of these have been aged in an oven after the treatments have been applied. And you can see this first treatment in red really doesn't seem to do much of anything. And size exclusion chromatography can tell you that. You can see both the degree of polymerization is about the same and the distribution shape itself, the size of all the molecules in that sample are about the same. They look almost identical to that condition without any treatment at all. And if you look at two additional treatments, again, both after aging, but these start to look much more like pristine samples. And so by eye, it might be hard to distinguish these two. They both look about the same in the paper material itself after aging, but these distributions and this degree of polymerization measurement shows you that one of them is actually slightly and subtly better than the other one. It helps preserve these high molecular weight components in the cellulose. You still have these million molecular weight species that match up to if you had unaged. So you can stick it in an oven, apply heat and humidity, and we know that this treatment is perhaps better than this one. And we're, we're trying to dig a little bit into why that might be. But that's just an example to start getting you thinking, maybe perhaps get used to looking at, at what this data might look like. And if you noticed on that why size exclusion chromatography slide I, I showed, I talked about microsampling. And a couple of the popular methods that I talked about for quantifying paper condition um, take up a lot of paper. And so that's a scale schematic representation of an 8.5 by 11 piece of paper. And to do a physical condition test, a fold endurance test, for example, needs about half of an 8.5 by 11. Similarly, a pH extraction needs about the same amount of material. And so it's fine on lab scale papers. But if this is something you want to do to a collections object, that's just not acceptable. Size exclusion chromatography can use dozens of micrograms of material, right? So this is a cute little paper biopsy machine. It's just a kind of tiny hole punch um, that punches out samples that are about one millimeter in diameter. And those can perhaps be taken from collections objects, from blank pages in the back of a book, from detritus that has been shorn off of a very fragile material. And that's perhaps a little more acceptable. And so the question is, how can we apply this to actual collections items or perhaps books. And so I wanted to start using this on a collection of books. And the books that immediately came to mind were the Barrow Collection. And William Barrow may be a familiar name uh, to some of the folks in this room. Um, he was a paper chemist, did a lot of work in the 50s and 60s on naturally aged paper chemistry and what's going on in here. William Barrow is working on a, a fold tester. There's Cindy Ryan from our research group doing her best William Barrow impression. Um, and if you haven't seen a fold tester, I'm a big fan of them. They're very visceral machines. You get a real sense of what's going on when a fold tester is operating. And what William Barrow was trying to do was he was trying to connect physical properties to chemical properties in naturally aged books. 
So taking a naturally aged collection and seeing how you can connect the chemical components in paper to the physical condition uh, of the durability and brittleness of that paper. So I'm going to take a bit of a detour now, and I'm going to step away from all of the technical science stuff and give you a little bit of history about William Barrow and the Barrow Labs. Um, like I said, some folks may be familiar with him, some folks may not, and, and it's kind of an interesting story. Um, and so Barrow oftentimes gets a lot of credit uh, for being the originator of research on pH and alum rosin sizing and its effect on naturally aged materials, but it built on a lot of work that had already been going on in the field. Um, Kohler and Hall in Sweden in the 20s uh, had done perhaps the first definitive connection between acidity and paper deterioration. There was then a lot of work done in the 30s at the National Bureau of Standards, at the Government Printing Office, uh, in the National Archives, looking into the fundamental science of paper degradation, looking at whether fiber processing is more influential than the fiber source, uh, whether groundwood papers have a different effect on paper longevity than rag papers, on whether sizing and the acidity that's inherent in sizing affects paper degradation. And William Barrow was a bookbinder and, and a craftsman before uh, he started looking into the chemistry of materials. And he started working with, with these researchers in the National Bureau of Standards, in, in the National Archives, learning chemistry from them at that time. And that kind of sparked his interest from just bookbinding to the more fundamental chemistry of paper conservation. And it, it led to his interests spanning that type of chemistry, ranging from cellulose acetate lamination to deacidification to aging of book papers, both artificial and natural, to the manufacturing of durable papers. And I'm not going to talk too much about it, but it's impossible to talk about William Barrow without talking about cellulose acetate lamination. Um, and so he spent a lot of time developing, refining, and pitching the idea of cellulose acetate lamination as he learned uh, alongside these researchers at NBS and the National Archives. And this was during the 1930s, took a lot of input from um, Burden Scribner, who was the chief of the paper section at the National Bureau of Standards, worked with Arthur Kimberly, uh, chief of the Division of Repair and Preservation at the National Archives at the time. It involved development uh, visits to the National Archives, prototyping uh, with the Mariners Museum in Portsmouth, Virginia. And he came up with his method for cellulose acetate lamination, patented, oddly enough, with all of that collaboration with just his name on the patent uh, in 1941. And that's really where Barrow got his claim to fame. And after that, he, he received a grant from the Council on Library Resources to do studies on paper and book aging in Richmond, Virginia at his labs. Uh, and this was in the 1950s and 60s. And William Barrow said about this, um, perhaps in a quote illustrative of the work he was undertaking there, the task of the tester is to find among the hundreds of possible tests of the characteristics of a material, those which are really meaningful i.e. those which can be shown to correlate with actual experience in use. And so to undertake this research, he collected a thousand books. These were a thousand actual books spanning about 400 years of print dates, so about 400 years of natural aging in this book collection, all sorts of different compositions, whether they came from wood pulps, whether they came from rag fibers, different geographies, mostly from Western Europe, a lot from the United States, but obviously that included different climates as well. And his goal was to start doing tests on these books and to correlate, like I said, physical properties with chemical properties. And the initial tests were on about 500 books spanning the range from 1800 to 1900. Those eventually ballooned out by another 500 books going all the way back to 1500. Uh, and those included physical tests of, kind of you know, strength and, and durability by fold testing, like I showed you, and tear testing, which is exactly what it sounds like. Chemical tests started off with acidity and rosin testing, expanded out to looking at alum content and metal carbonate content. 
and fiber analysis as well. What type of fibers were in there, how large the fiber size was. And these are our pictures, um, not quite as fun as the, the animated pictures, but from the written reports from William Barrow, 1950s, um, showing the equipment that he was using. And if you look through these reports from the 50s and 60s, actually what, what I find a little bit more fun is they are very 19. 50s in their presentation. Um, he is showing some of the researchers from the lab. Here it wasn't just William Barrow, for example. Here is Mrs. Virginia Roberson, both technician and secretary, uh, putting samples in an aging oven. Uh, Mrs. Patricia Turner working on the fold tester. Mrs. Emily Parr taking pH measurements. So these are very much of the time, but kind of fun pictures that are, are shown in, in the Barrow reports. It shows you how many people are working in the lab here. And the lab from William Barrow produced pages and pages of data about pages and pages of books. And after he collected all these data, he started making correlations. So for example, year of manufacture, checking, checking the tear strength. How does tear strength in naturally aged books change over time with printing? How does pH and acidity and chemical content change over time with printing? And then how do you correlate those? That's down at the bottom there. Some of the correlations between alum content and acidity and how that interfaces with age of production of the books. And so the conclusions of the Barrow Lab came out and they were summarized, you know, the effects of acidity, the effects of alum, the effects of fiber type, High acidity, low pH tends to lead to poor physical conditions. The presence of alum is usually a bad indicator unless it's present alongside calcium carbonate. Fiber type, wood pulp type papers tend to be in worse condition than rag type papers. The mid 1800s onwards showed to be particularly problematic. It was again, the perfect storm of all of these components coming together uh, and those ended up being in, uh, interpreted by Barrow as suggestions on paper manufacture, what can be done to make more durable, more permanent papers, as well as work on comparing artificial aging and, and rigorously controlled natural aging studies. And really, it was never explicitly concluded by Barrow, um, but the conclusion here is those, those results really right, are not new conclusions. The work that was done by the National Bureau of Standards, by the National Archives in the 20s and 30s, knew that acidity was bad, knew that alum rosin sizing was bad. But what this proved was that those results held in actual naturally aged book collections, not just any naturally aged book collection, a really ambitious naturally aged book collection, a rather ungainly naturally aged book collection. So the fact that you could take those conclusions from test papers at NBS or the government printing office and say, we collected a thousand books from all over, all sorts of ages, all sorts of composition, and these results hold is rather impressive. There were lots of conclusions about Barrow's work. Um, he is often interpreted as the originer, originator of results on pH and alum rosin and wood content. Um, for example, Rutherford Rogers, who was the university librarian at Yale, 1985, um, was talking about Barrow and said, Barrow startled the library world with his results, right? So, so it's not out, it's not uncommon to see Barrow interpreted as the originator of these results, even though some results came before him. And, and his lab um, is not entirely innocent uh, in this um, perception. If you look at the citation records in these reports, starting with the very first one in 1959, about a third of them had in their technical citations work from the National Bureau of Standards, work from the National Archives. Um, by the last report in 1967, um, most of them had disappeared. Um, less than one in 20 were from those sources. They were mostly self-citations of the Barrow Lab. And so some other folks have become critical um, of, of that assessment. Uh, Nicholson Baker, who is perhaps a little bit infamous for his critique on library sciences, the total extreme of the criticism here, really questioning why Barrow did any invasive testing to begin with. Um, he said, if Barrow hadn't chosen to destroy yet another page in order to perform his parlor trick, the recipe for chicken a la terrapin would very likely be with us today. So you can find both assessments 
in the scholarly literature about William Bauer, that he really had this large influential role to play in paper science and that he was just duplicating others' efforts. And so I would say that my personal opinion of William Barrow is a little more sympathetic with that of Barbara Higginbotham and, and Sally Cruz Rogi. And a lot of this history comes from Sally Cruz Rogi. She did some excellent work. I, I highly recommend looking up her um, deep dive into to William Barrow's history, um, saying that at the time that that original research was done in the 20s and 30s, um, librarian conservation-minded librarians at the time were more interested in durability and in in-use durability, in taking a page and making sure it's not breaking while users are interacting with the books. Uh, and so the reports from the National Bureau of Standards, from the government printing office, were highly technical, highly constrained to the government, didn't make their way much to librarians um, that did a lot of work. For example, here's at the Enoch Pratt Free Library, just doing mending and working to make sure that the books could be used and were in good condition for use. And Barbara Higginbotham and, and both Sally Cruz Rogia make the argument that Barrow is the great promoter here. He's the one who takes these results and perhaps by using a collection of a thousand actual books from all over the place, a little more representative of what is actually in libraries. It's something that can be, you know, connected with on a, a visceral level. Um, and so while he may not have done exactly the original research, his results were widely influ influential for a good number of reasons. And so after William Barrow's work, um, the books found their way to the library here in preservation research and testing. And the value of these books now is entirely in their scientific content. They have been destructively tested. There are very few books going back to the 1500s that have had pages ripped out of them for tear testing and fold testing. And the fact that we can still do this adds tremendous value to that collection. And so those were donated to the library in the 1970s. Uh, they've since been rehoused, sorted, and barcoded. Now they're in uh, PRTD's Center for the Library Analytical Scientific Samples. Um, they serve as kind of a small-scale museum of book arts. You can take them apart, look at, at what's going on at different books over different times. But they do provide another opportunity for research. There's been progress in material science. There's been progress in polymer science. Polymer science was barely a field when Barrow started his work. There's been improvement in analytical and, and instrumental methods since the 1950s, for example, size exclusion chromatography. And as a study of natural aging, it's kind of interesting that there's been another 50 years of aging. And we'll go back to Rutherford Rogers, that librarian from Yale University. We'll finish out his quote that I gave you a taste of before. Barrow startled the library world with his research results which suggested that only 3% of the papers published between 1900 and 1949 could be expected to last for more than 50 years. William Wilson at the National Bureau of Standards around the year 2000 could do the math and said, it's almost the end of the century, and somehow most of those books haven't known that they were supposed to disappear. <laughs> so some of the conclusions from that data obviously need revisiting. And so one of the tremendous efforts that have been undertaken in PRTD is digitizing those pages and pages and pages of data. So there are a thousand books. There's about 16-ish data points each. I say ish, some books are missing a couple data points. Um, so that gives you 16,000 data points and they fall in all types of categories. There's time and chronological data, what year they were published. There's categorical data, what cities they were published in. There's binary data, right? Yes or no, simple thumbs up, thumbs down. Is there alum, is there not alum? And then there's numerical data, pH and fold data, which can span any range of numbers. And so while William Barrow had all sorts of you know, interesting methods and techniques and technicians and secretaries working for him. What he didn't have was a desktop computer. And so now we can look at these correlations again. And the first thing you can do once we digitized all this is plot out all of the raw data, the entirety of it. And it's not as pretty as perhaps it once looked. There's a lot of scatter, there's a lot of outliers. And that's not unexpected. These are real books with unknown histories from all over the place and who knows where they were at what point in time. Um, but it just goes to show how messy it can be. Um, one thing I've done is, is started 
manipulating it a little bit to see if there's anything else you can learn. So, so let's move away from the big scatter. These are some box plots. Um, I know box plots probably something you haven't thought about since high school. Honestly, not really something I've thought about since high school. But they do give you a statistical snapshot by decade. Instead of Barrow's plots, which were just median values by decade, you pick the median value and it gives you nice clean plots. This gives you some, some more data on what's going on in the distributions over time. For example, uh, if you've got a keen eye uh, and the projector's colors are behaving themselves, you can see that the data is right skewed. What that means is that the average value for a decade is higher than the median value for a decade. You've got a couple of odd high-end outliers usually for each decade that pull data towards the right. Most of the lower performing book, there are more lower performing books than there are higher performing ones pretty much across the board by decade. And you can do this for any of the data, for the full data by year, for the tear resistance, for the chemical properties. Um, and so what that does and what, what I like doing when I do this analysis is it takes the original data, what Barrow was looking at. He had this original data. We have this original data. We start with the same numbers. He's going just taking the median values, making nice clean-ish plots. And then we can take it and we still get the same trend line. You can see up till about 1700, there's a pretty even plateau in physical properties and then it declines precipitously but you don't lose the data that you lose in the representation of data using just median values. You can also do some nice heat mapping to start looking at combined variables over time. So these are now three variables in one go, looking at year and pH and how fold endurance changes over time with both of those, right? The hotter values correspond to higher fold endurance. Um, you can do the same with tear resistance. Both are physical measurements, right? You would expect physical measurements, the physical durability of the books to, to kind of match each other. And you can see in some cases that's true, right? In the, the 1650s to 1700s-ish at high pHs, so non-acidic, that's true. They both match. But then it's very easy to reveal these odd little outliers that I don't have answers to yet about why there's a couple books in here in about 1850 that are acidic that have really high tear resistance but don't have corresponding fold endurance. And so data manipulation representations like this are something you couldn't do in Barrow's day. And there's something now that we can start looking at and figuring out what's going on. And so I'll jump back now to the technical stuff I started with at the beginning about cellulose and size and what's going on with cellulose size in these samples. The Barrow data has macro scale measurements. What's happening at the physical hand scale, brittleness. Um, it has all the way down to chemical level information, whether there's alum present, whether the, you know, what, what the acidity is, which really is just a measure of effective ion concentration. But it's missing this intermediary scale. It's missing what's going on at the size scale of the cellulose molecules. And so we come back to microinvasive testing. That's why this collection was so interesting to me to use micro testing on, is that this is an actual book collection. It has data on it. It's something we might be able to correlate to actual collections objects. And we can use now very small, minimally invasive sampling to get another data point on this interesting book collection. And so the first thing um, that I did is, I've, so I've got data points now on about 100 of these 1,000 books, molecular weight values of the cellulose in about 100 of the books. And you can check that against the original Barrow measurements of acidity. And you can see that above neutral, there's a lot of scatter, but below neutral pH in acidic books, there's a decent, pretty good correlation between acidity and size of your cellulose, the molecular weight, the DP of your cellulose. And the first reaction on seeing this plot is, well, duh, right? As it's more acidic, your cellulose is gonna break down and you're gonna have smaller, lower molecular weight cellulose. That's not terribly interesting. But it is interesting that this is a real world collection of books. These aren't lab scale papers. These aren't things that we prepared and artificially aged in a lab. It's a real world collection of books. It's unknown history, we don't know if any given book in a collection sat in grandma's attic for 100 years. It's unknown geography. It may have been printed in Italy, but did it then 
spend the rest of its life in Sweden before it found its way to the collection. We don't know what the housing was like. We don't know the composition. We, there's sizing all over the place. And we can draw essentially a fairly universal trend line between acidity and molecular weight in actual book collection objects. That's a powerful method. And so how do they correlate to physical properties? These are color-coded. It may be hard to tell by decade. Um, and so you can see as the books get newer, less aged, they actually are in worse condition. That's not a surprise to any of us. Books from the 18, late, middle to eight, late 1800s are in worse condition than the older ones. The physical condition is lower. The molecular weights are lower. The cellulose size is lower. But a lot of Barrow's data used pH as one of the primary indicators of paper condition, arguing that if you know pH, if you can control pH, if you can measure pH and acidity, you can predict what the physical condition of a book might be like. And what we can do is we can say in this regime before you start seeing a lot of scatter at the high end, that the molecular weight, the DP, actually correlates to physical properties closer than the best predictors that Barrow had at the time. So that there's some physical meaning here to the size of the cellulose and what the physical condition is of a book. And that that's really seemingly a powerful tool to use you know, about one millimeter diameter of a sample to be able to tell you something about the quantifiable condition of a piece of paper without having to take that half a page of an eight and a half by 11 sheet. There's also this question of what's been going on in the last 50 years. So this is Riley Thomas. Uh, she was working with me uh, as a junior fellow this summer, uh, looking at both molecular weight measurements, she was responsible for some of those data points that you saw in the last couple plots, um, but also looking at the dynamic changing over time, right? The Barrow data is nice. You can say what happened to a book 300 years ago, but it is a snapshot at this moment in time. Uh, it doesn't answer the question of what's happening dynamically with the books. How are any of those properties changing over natural aging conditions? And so what Riley measured was acidity and compared it to Barrow's measurements for acidity of the same books. And so what I'm showing here is just um, Barrow's me lab's measurements of acidity, the recently measured acidity. If we measured the exact same values as Barrow, they would fall on this straight line. And we see that at low end, that's kind of true. At the high end, that's kind of true. But in the middle, they tend to start deviating consistently lower than you would expect. And we, again, don't have a good answer why. Um, I have a couple of ideas. Maybe there's enough um, buffer alkaline reserve in the non-acidic books that it prevents any significant pH changes over time. Maybe these acidic ones have kind of bottomed out at the most acidic values that they'll get to, and it's the neutral ones that you expect to change over time. Just a thought, we don't have any proof of that yet. Um, also looked at physical testing data same scheme here. This is a lot more concerning. Um, the physical condition here measuring by fold data, if we would expect everything to fall on the same line, that's not what we get. In fact, everything is a lot lower. The condition of the books physically is changing a lot more rapidly for the worse than the chemical properties are. And that's just a zoom in of that really clustered region down at the bottom. And so there's this question of the physical properties changing, seemingly to change very fast. The chemical properties in terms of acidity, perhaps, are changing a little bit more slowly. And so what's going on? Um, and this is something that size exclusion chromatography might be able to shed some insight to. This is what I've started doing some work on now. This is stepping aside from Barrow for a second, talking about artificial aging of book paper. You can see that even after just one day, that's that green arrow there, there's a drop in physical properties. And that's something we can measure by size exclusion chromatography. Um, you can see changes in the distribution of cellulose size, even after just one day of aging. Um, these higher molecular weight components are starting to go away. They're starting to be replaced by smaller molecular weight components you expect from chain scissions. Overall molecular weight averages start going down. And you can see that even just one day of artificial aging. And so if you look at these, what's a little bit deceptive in these plots is it doesn't 
tell you anything about the individual books. You lose sight a little bit of which book is connected to which data point. And so I've pulled out two here, pointing to them um, red and blue. So the blue one is from 1664, the red one is from 1745. These were their pH values, the old one, the new one for both. Um, and so these were books, one that was non-acidic in nature, one that was about neutral. You can see that there's a dramatic reduction in the fold endurance of the neutral book. There's an even more dramatic change, not in terms of raw number, but in terms of overall fold strength. You're losing almost, uh, almost you know, down to 10% of your original fold strength. This one, not quite as much. Um, and can you tell anything in the molecular weight distributions of those books? And what's perhaps interesting here is this book, the one in red, the one from 1745, that showed that big overall reduction in fold endurance starts to show a tiny shoulder showing up in the lower molecular weight region. What you would expect to see from the result of the beginnings of chain scission, perhaps showing that there are really detrimental effects on physical properties with even just this really small amount of smaller molecular weight cellulose starting to form that you may not be able to see from pH measurements alone, right? This pH change, whether you go from seven to about seven and a half, whether your measurement is effectively unchanged and shows you that this book is not acidic at all, doesn't quite match up with the physical properties you're seeing. Whereas these changes in the size of the cellulose is something that does start correlating. And that's something that I've found in general to be true, that the books with low fold endurance, with low physical properties, start having these really subtle but indicative shoulders appear in the lower molecular weight regions of the cellulose, that you can see something is happening that perhaps is not revealed in other measurement techniques that have been used. And so technical conclusions, um, I hope I've showed you that, that micro sampling by size exclusion chromatography, just one millimeter of sample, um, something that I've been developing and, and starting to use now on the Barrow collection to show how it might be used in real books, can be useful either in addition to other measurement techniques or as a replacement for other highly invasive techniques. It reveals some new insights into the chemical mechanisms of degradation that you may have been misled by measuring other physical measurements alone. Um, having that Barrow data is also nice. It gives us additional statistical analysis and correlations um, that haven't been done before. There are things that we can build on. There are things that we can keep investigating, um, looking at that dynamic age-based tracking, right? And so thinking about dynamic age-based tracking and what's changing over the course of 50 years, um, I want to talk, I want to take the last minute to, to talk a little bit on my thoughts just in general on, on the Barrow Labs. Um, and hopefully you'll indulge me in just getting a little bit philosophical for a moment to discuss what I've taken away from working with the Barrow Labs collections. I've, I've been really glad to be able to work with such an esoteric and unique collection. Um, and the thing I'm most impressed by when I look at Barrow's work, when I add to Barrow's work, is not necessarily their insight or even um, their outreach in promoting what the chemistry is of book paper. The thing I'm most impressed by, by the Barrow Labs and the collections that we have is their notes and their diligence, right? Leave it to a lab that's conserved, that's concerned with paper permanence to find a permanent home for these objects and these data in a naturally aged collection spanning half a millennium. It shows to me and really highlights to me and has stressed the importance to me, the importance of technical notebooks and technical note keeping and keeping track of everything that you've done, particularly for people who are concerned with preservation over the natural lifetimes of materials, right? I hope that my notes are as useful someday as Barrow's notes, even if it's in regret, right? If 
God forbid I do something that's regretted later on, hopefully no one should go back and look on any of my work and say, what the hell was he thinking? <laughs> and should know what I did so that they can go back and change it. And so it strikes me as especially true when discussing natural aging, right? It's the nature of the job as preservation researchers. Odds are good that none of us will see the results of our labor, for good or for bad, right? It's the nature of long-term preservation. It's the nature of working with materials where our goal is to have them outlive us, right? We could mess it up badly, but I hope everyone else is inspired here to let no one be able to say, what the hell were they thinking? <laughs> so I'd like to thank a lot of interns who have worked on this collection, a lot of staff in PRTD who've worked on this collection over the years, making it look nice and pretty and archivally housed and digitized, which was a tremendous effort. Um, as Fenella mentioned in the very brief bio, I do not have a conservation or preservation background before I came here. So I'm especially thankful. I'm thankful to all the PRTD staff. I'm especially thankful um, to Cindy and Lynn and Amanda who have helped kind of guide me into the conservation and preservation world a little bit. Uh, there are a couple references that have helped me along the way that I've referenced pretty heavily, Sally Rogia, for example. Um, but I'd be happy to take any questions or comments if you have them. Thanks. Questions and um, for the benefit of our uh, external viewers, I'm going to ask Andrew to rephrase the question so that they can hear it. And down the very back. Thank you. All right. Um, this might be a bit too complex to get into, but I'm just curious how you isolate or purify cellulose from paper, which has obviously tons of other stuff in it, and then how you from that are able to Yep, and that, that's, a, that's a concern, um, and I didn't dive too deep into it. Uh, so, sorry, the question for online is how we make sure that we isolate the cellulose from the paper and make sure that we're not introducing other artifacts by selectively removing parts of it uh, or not removing parts of it. And I would say that a lot of the work has been done before me. That's, that's the hard work that had been gone on in, in fundamental labs. And that's what I was talking about in this sample preparation that's fairly non-trivial. It involves a lot of solvent exchange steps, including warm water, including ethanol, including dimethyl acetamide. Uh, and that removes some of the inks. It removes the sizing, if there's gelatin sizing, if there's any kind of large, um, also large polymers, protein type materials that are in there. <clears throat> um, there's all of these insoluble components too, right? Fillers and lignin. Lignin, especially in Woodpulp paper, very large scale, uh, big molecules. Those get separated out by centrifugation and filtration. We use very fine mesh filters. Um, and the, the crux of it is this solvent system, this lithium chloride uh, dimethyl acetamide solvent system. And there's been some really fundamental work on the physics of that using light scattering uh, to show that it is a good solvent, by which I mean cellulose up to 10 million molecular weight dissolves well in this solvent system. Um, and so if we know that cellulose is well dissolved, if we know that we're removing all these other fillers, that's about the best that we can do. Um, I can't say for sure that if there's degraded you know, lignin, little bits of lignin that have broken off that skew the averages one way or another. If there's little bits of gelatin sizing that have degraded to smaller molecular weight that can survive um, and get processed into solution, that those aren't skewing the results one way or another. Um, but it's about the best that anyone has come up with so far. Does that answer your question? Can, that can be linked we, uh, to the website um, and 
yeah, go out as an RSVP when the next publish, so we can get back to you. But there's also some great work that we mentioned that, you know, in collaboration with uh, conservation. So, um, yeah, I want to make sure everyone gets credit. Okay, Jenny. Um, this is um, Jenny Biggs. I'm the team lead on the project that you're referring to. Um, the work on Ryan Golding, and we're uh, working on uh, the publication at the moment and disbanding word of it. So, um, we'll keep you posted. Andrew's work is the last part of this that we're that was really kind of fundamental to the project and there's important elements there discussing all of that and then Sorry, for listeners online we're just discussing publication and how how results are gonna get disseminated over time. Um, but we'll be keeping people abreast who are interested in it. Mm -hmm. So the question was um, checking, if you're measuring the molecular weights of naturally aged historic samples, uh, is there anything that can be said for the original molecular weights, uh, particularly as it concerns, say, the sourcing of the material or the process making the material, wood pulp versus cotton? I get you right? Uh, that's something that I've been working on uh, in the lab here using our paper reference materials in class, the Center for Library Analytical Scientific Samples. Um, we have various wood pulp papers. We have various standardized papers. We have rag papers. We can go back to these papers and look um, whether they're rag papers, whether they're wood pulp. And so the question about what's the variability in them um, is something I can't quite answer yet. I don't know. And we can't go back, obviously, and measure where these books started from. So we don't know how they've been changing over time. Um, but in terms of the papers themselves, we can start with our lab papers that have been, you know, historically prepared or that are rag papers or that are wood pulp papers and subject them to artificial aging. Or virgin material. Right, right. But we could start with we'd obviously measure the, the molecular weight at the start. And I don't have an answer yet. It's, it's, there's no easy trend to be drawn between. Go back and look at cotton. Do you see a difference between Egyptian cotton and uh, some other species? That I have not done yet. And that's a good question. Oh boy. So, so yeah, so the question from online was, was there anything that Barrow's labs could have done differently in hindsight that would have been more helpful? Um, I'd say they did a pretty tremendous job. That's much more data than you expect to get from most researchers. That's dodging the question a little bit, I know. Um, I would say uh, that you know some of some of the where different samples were taken in different parts of a book would perhaps have been a little bit interesting. We can go back and flip through his books and see where pages have been torn out, but we don't know whether those pages were used for tear resistance in the cross print direction or tear resistance in the machine direction or any of these things. And so again, a plug for PRTD where we've got class D coming up with metadata where we're tracking which pages are removed for which tests and what data is connected to what. Um, I think that's that would, would have been interesting to have kept track of because um, we do see some differences whether you take a sample from, you know, the bottom edge of a book versus the middle of a book, or the middle of a page versus the edge of a page. There are some slight differences. If you take it from the front of a book or the back of the book or the middle of the book, there's a little bit of differences and how much those differences come out in his data, that would have been interesting to know.
scientific samples would then be put selected, e.g. interior edge or Switzerland, and were you able to choose similar locations to both possibilities? Yes, so one thing we've been, one thing Riley Thomas, who was working here, was also interested in is where are we testing, right? And so I'll use one of her slides, and this, this book was only not quite accidentally chosen for this past week, um, kind of timely appropriate. This is the 1800s study of the sky with a chapter on the moon and eclipses. But Riley was interested in, in where you're sampling. And so the first answer to that question is I can say that we've been consistent with these molecular weight measurements against Barrow's data of picking just um, away from the margins and away from the text block towards the bottom of the page. Um, and every sample we've measured so far using this method has, from, in a book has gone from that spot just for consistency from a randomly selected page in the middle, not close to either end. We do see differences depending on where you check. And that's something that needs a little bit of work to figure out and a little bit of work to systemize over time and that I, again, don't have a terribly good explanation for. But for now, consistency within the Barrow Book Collections is what we're going for. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.